Thank you for a fabulous rendition of that song by our own Sandy Atto herself. There's a side, there's a side about Sandy you don't know. Hey man, there's a, there's a side about Sandy you don't know. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. There's a side about her you don't know. She owns a 1965 Corvette original. Oh, you just take that. All right, let's go. Well, we want to, first of all, we want to welcome Frida White back. Frida, we're glad to have you back. She'd been home nursing broken, broken wrists. And Chloe's going to be 16 soon. Yay, Chloe. <laughs> The Franskis have visitors from Minnesota, Joyce and Mike Dio. Is that right? Raise your hand. They're right there in the middle. We're glad to have them. And Roger and Roger and um, Wendy. Wendy, thank you. Roger and Wendy. Roger's, uh, he told me this, uh, his baby brother is here. And it's John Smith and his wife, Sue, Sue right back there. He told me to say that baby brother business. And underneath the, the glass table, ladies, are more boxes Lynn brought this morning, our, our, you know, our witnessing boxes. So, and there are bags to take them. So if you want some, take them home today and, and hand them out because that's what they're for. Okay, thank you. When I was young, being a baby brother wasn't, I didn't like that. Now it's good, isn't it? Hey, man, I tell you, being a baby brother now, it's like, hey, my old brothers. We had a real blessing this week. We had a number of blessings this week. God, God's good to us. We had a great ladies' meeting, from what I could tell. And, uh, yeah, you girls did a good job. A lot of the guys in the background helped them, put the thing together, chairs in and out, tables up and down. And just then the cleaning, Nora's group came in, Nora Carbon's group came in, cleaned up afterwards, which is a big deal, and straightened up everything. The boys put the chairs up, and so we're the beneficiaries of all that work. Appreciate everybody that came and helped. We had, like I told you, we had 23. In spite of all that, we still had 23 men on door to door. But we had another blessing. We had a leak. We knew we had a leak in the uh, school building area. It took us a while to isolate where it was, but we figured out we had a eight-gallon-an-hour leak. Now, you understand that we're on sewer water, so every gallon of water you, char you get charged two gallons of sewer, so it's not cheap. So we were losing water at eight gallons. At, from midnight to 6 a.m. when nobody's using anything, we knew we were using eight gallons. An hour we turned it off, it stopped. But our fear was that it was underneath the slab of the building because that's the way in 88 they ran the main water feed underneath the slab. And so I was kind of bummed out about that for the last three weeks, praying to God, because it's about twenty five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 to have your house replumbed, to have that building replumbed from the top down rather than the bottom up. And so I was kind of mulling that around and everything. So we hired a, we hired a, a detection. There's, if, by the way, if you ever have a leak, sleuth. Leak detection, very professional group, very straight up and down. They come in, they tell you what they're going to charge you. Sleuth, yeah, that's it, sleuth. That's the name of it. They've been operating since 81. So they're, they're recommended by Steve, the plumber. Steve Richards is the one that recommended them to me from Bear Plumbing. The man, I mean, it was right on. The guy came in an hour and a half, found the leak. It was in the courtyard which is fabulous. We dug it up and fixed it, and so we're all set. We got, we got by for $550. Yeah, hey, $550 instead of 25000 or so, and the mess of, you know, ripping the wall, walls out and doing all that stuff. So God was, he was kind to us, kind to us. He remembered us in that area. So we're, hopefully we're back to normal now for a while. So anyway, I want to present to you a brother. I, I love the brother Todd. Don't get up yet, brother. Uh, <clears throat> I love brother Todd. You want to pray for brother Todd? Your brother, pray for he married a Latina. 
And that's just a whole nother experience of life. May, may the Lord bless you. I'm not even going to comment on that. <laughs> I'm pleading the fifth on this one, brother. <laughs> if you've ever seen a Latina mad, brother. Somebody said, you speak Spanish? I said, no, I understand it a little bit, but I really understand it when my wife's angry. Because <laughs> I've never heard more R's rolled in one <laughs> sentence. I actually told that somebody door to door the other day. <laughs> so they were Spanish and I couldn't speak much. I said, but I know my wife speaks Spanish when she's angry. <laughs> I was thinking about the baby brother thing, and, you know, I grew up, and, man, I heard it once. I heard it a thousand times. Whiff, you got the baby face. You got the baby face. I hated that. Even in my 40s, even in my 40s, I heard that, and I couldn't stand it. Now that I'm 60, I'm good with it, brother. <laughs> Call me baby face. I'm, we, got, we, got, we got a devil in the, is it me? Okay, let's see if we can, are we going to be good with that? We're going to scare people off with that, that noise. Another mic? We'll try this, we'll try this one. First of all, I hope, I hope everybody came here hungering and thirsting for the Word of God, because I'm going old school on you today. It simply means I'm going to load your boat, so now I'm going to warn you ahead of time. I'm going to give you a lot of information, so it's a lot for you to go back, sort some of this out, think about it, meditate upon it, hopefully study it. You know, it's just now and then we're just something God gives you, and you just, you got to let it rip, and that's going to be this morning out of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Yes, we're still there, and uh, we'll move on to chapter 4 most likely next week, but we're going to deal with a subject that's, I wouldn't say controversial for anybody in here, but it is controversial to the umbrella of Christianity, and I say that because in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, is going to deal with the judgment seat of Christ. The problem we have <clears throat> in Christianity today is there's this general teaching and idea that God's got this one judgment coming for everybody and that judgment's a general judgment and everybody's going to stand and they're going to be judged for whether they did something good or they did something bad and then God's going to determine the outcome of where you spend eternity. Folks, nothing could be further from the truth when it comes to that. I'm going to go back to a verse that I hope all of you are familiar with but something to be reminded of in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15. Study you got that? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We're going to do that this morning. Um, that's why I mean we'll load your boat with a lot of scripture. I was just going to throw it out there and not have it on the screen up here, but time, as time went on, I realized there's a lot here I want you to see. So hopefully you got this set up here. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Back in business now. All right. Praise the Lord. See that? We didn't miss a beat. Judgment seat of Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. If you read down, I'm not going to read all these verses. Verses 10 through 15. This is a really important area of Scripture that Paul begins to address about what are you doing for God? And that how this is going to show up at the judgment seat of Christ. It's, it's, God's going to clear up a lot of stuff at the judgment seat of Christ. And again, um, this is mentioned two more times in Scripture. By name, called the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. When he says we, he's recluding himself and to all those he's writing to. And the epistles are written to believers. I know that we understand that, but I'm going to prove that out this morning with three different arguments of why the judgment seat of Christ is for believers and why the great white throne judgment is not for believers. So we've got to really get, dial this in. The other portion of scriptures in Romans chapter 14, verse 10, we must all 
stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We, again, being Paul and all the believers he's writing to. And so, clearly, it's the context that's important that the judgment seat of Christ, also known as the Bema seat, will be the judgment for believers. Not for sin, but for your works, what you did in the body of Christ. And that's clear. You'll see that here and why it's distinguished uh, from the great white throne, which most people, that's where they think everything's going to get settled. It's not for the believer. The believer's sin was settled where? On Christ at the cross. The wrath of God that was on us as sinners was transferred to Him, the penalty, and when we believed on Him, He took the wrath, He took our sin, and we've been set free and been given life. Those who do not have Christ, have the wrath of God still abiding on them. They're the ones who face the great white throne. Now, I know we know that, but can we explain that to people in great detail, what it means, why there's a difference? That's why we're going to rightly divide the word of truth this morning. If we look at, <clears throat> again, the judgment, I just kind of summary of what I just said. This judgment that we're going to talk about in the judgment seat of Christ is the works of a believer, not their sin. So as we look at the two different judgments, the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne are not equal. They're not the same. Somebody says, how do you know they're not the same? Well, let's start with the fact that they're spelled differently. Now, I'm not trying to be a wise guy here, but God, ha if he wanted it to be the same, he would have said it was the same. God has a purpose. Every word has purpose and meaning. You'll see a little bit of that this morning. And so clearly... There's a distinguishing difference between the judgment seat of Christ, known as the Bema seat, and great white throne. By the way, when we use the word Bema seat, that's, that's the Greek word for judgment seat that Paul uses. Do you know what that, that originates from? The ancient Greeks would set up a throne, a seat, at the finish line of a race, and the individual sitting in that would determine who won the race. And, they, they, and as soon as that was determined, it was usually very quickly, they would give out the, a reward for the one who finished the race, first, second, and third. That's where they get the word Bema Seat. So really, the Bema Seat for the believer is about rewards that God has planned for you. But you're going to see in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, there's people who will lose their reward because they didn't do what God had them to do. So that's really what you're going to get out of this in the judgment seat of Christ. And we're going to rightly divide the word of truth. So we're going to look at, we're going to look at three arguments, as I call three positions of a Bible-believing Christian who takes the word of God literally and divides it properly. The first argument is if we were to turn our books to Revelation 19, we read in chapter 7 through 10 about a marriage that takes place in heaven. Now we, we could go through that whole subject about the marriage, but I'm going to try to explain to you that when this takes place, there's a timeliness to the book of Revelation. If you study it out, it's very important about the order of events. But here we see in Revelation 19 a marriage taking place. And we'll have to determine who's in the marriage. But when it takes place is before the second coming of Christ, before the thousand year reign, and before the white throne. So there's a group of people who were at a marriage that takes place before all those events take place, the second coming, the thousand year. That's important because the great white throne takes place after those events. It takes place after the second coming, after the thousand year reign of Christ. Who are the individuals that are involved in this marriage? We go back to Revelation chapter 5. 4 and 5, the context is heaven, represented by the saints, and they're there worshiping in chapter 5, the Lamb of God, who, by the way, is, is preparing to open the seals. The seals that he's going to open are for the great the tribulation that's going to be unfolding on the earth for seven years. So the context in Revelation 5 is heaven. Very important. We read here, I feel like this thing's pulling me. We read here, and this, this group of people <clears throat> that are in heaven they say, and has redeemed us, speaking to the Lamb of God. He's redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nations 
And what has he done? He's made us, under our God, kings and priests, notice, and we shall, future tense, reign with him. So they're in heaven. They're recognizing that they've been purchased by the blood of Christ. Now, if you go back into any of the epistles, you'll find something interesting. We'll take an example. Colossians chapter 1. To the saints and faithful brethren which are in Colossae. You ever read that? The opening salutation. To the saints, writing to believers. And in the same chapter, he writes, We've been redeemed by thy blood and the forgiveness of sins. That's what he says in Colossians chapter 1. So that is believers who have been redeemed by the blood. Now they're in the context of heaven and they've been redeemed by the blood. Those are the ones who participate in the marriage. Have you been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb? Well, if you have, then this is where you'll take, this is where you'll be. And where you'll be in the, the, the situation that's taking place, the marriage is before the second coming, before the reign. Notice the future. We shall reign. They're not reigning yet. Why? Because the tribulation has to take place. And the tribulation takes place, then Christ returns with his church. The, the marriage supper took place, and then they reign with Christ. Now, this is, this is one argument. The, the next argument will be even clearer. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. How did she make herself ready? She went through the judgment. The judgment not for their sin, but you'll see the judgment seat of Christ. And what she receives from this is fine linen, which represents the righteousness of the saints, the works of God's people. So, we read again in chapter 20, before the great white throne. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, on such the second death hath no power. The second death is a reference to your spiritual death. We may all physically die, that's, that's clear. But those that are in Christ, redeemed by the blood, don't die. They don't die a spiritual death. They ha have life on them, and that's the next argument we'll look at. But the second death hath no power. And they, it says, they, that group, shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So really, those that are born again, purchased by the blood of Christ, enter into heaven with him, go through the judgment seat of Christ, they come back with him and reign for him a thousand years. Then the great white throne happens. The individuals that are in that reign do not, get, take play, do not participate in the great white throne. You know what their participation is? They're judges. They actually do the work of judging the people at the great white throne with Christ. Probably helping cast people in to the lake of fire. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So those that don't have life, the, they have the second death on them, and they did not participate in the thousand-year reign. After the thousand-year, we read the following. I saw a great white throne which is the final judgment. Now, position number two, argument number two. This is really, this is the, the easier route to go for people that may not clearly understand what I was just talking about. But listen to what Jesus said in John 5, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on me hath everlasting life. The word hath is present tense. They have you didn't have it and lose it, and you don't have it and you're going to gain it. You either have it or you don't have it. It's present tense. It's with you. Why? Because God is life, and God gives you life, so now you have something that God is, which is eternal. Does that make sense? In Exodus chapter 3, God said to Moses, tell them, I am that I am sent you. I am that I am? What does that mean? I am means present tense. Not I was, not I will be, I am is present tense. Half everlasting life. You either have it or you don't. You'll see this in a minute. It'll be even clearer. And she'll come into condemnation, not come into condemnation, but is past. Here it is. This is so, these words are so important. 
I want you to lock this into your mind because this is going to be really important when we distinguish what the great white throne, who's the subject material of the great white throne. Because these individuals, Jesus said, believed on him, they have life, and now they've passed from death unto life. But yet people die all the time, physically. All of God's people have died in the past, that, that have died, they've gone on. But they, he said they passed from death unto life. So what did he mean? Spiritual death. They did not, they're not partakers of the second death, the spiritual death. They've passed from death unto life. Well, you ought to rejoice in that. Jesus said unto her, I am a resurrection and a life in John 11, 25, 26. I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Why? Because he's life and you have him. So you're, you have life. And he says, and whosoever, watch this, liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Now, if you understood that in a physical context, you'd think he's lying. Because believers for 2,000 years have died. He said they shall never die. What's he talking about? Spiritual death. The second death. They don't because they have life in them. And he says, believest thou this? I love this in Ephesians chapter 2. And you, talking to believers, hath he quickened. That's an old English term for you, he, made a, he made you alive. You're alive. Did you know before you knew Christ you were a walking dead person? And the wrath of God was on you. You had no life. You think you have life. People walk around all day long rejecting Christ, think they have life, and they have no life. The wrath of God, as far as God's concerned, they're dead until they're quickened, made alive. Now watch this. Who were dead? Past tense. Everything God speaks of is either you have life, present tense, or you were dead at one time, but now you're alive. So once again, the Christians, everything centers around this term life. Life, you've passed from death unto life, and you're alive, right? Well, let's see what God says in, about the great white throne. Ready? He says, oh, one last verse, sorry about that. He that hath the Son, I love this, it's so simple. You could sum it up right here. He that hath the Son hath life, but he, ha he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. It really comes down to very a black and white, easy, yes or no. You either have life or you don't have life. You could be breathing, living, doing whatever you want and be dead as, as far as God's concerned. So he that hath life and there's he that does not hath life. In fact, John chapter 3 goes as far as to say, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life and the wrath of God abideth on him. And if the wrath of God is on you, it ain't coming off until you get Christ. Because the wrath will find itself in the lake of fire. That's where God's wrath finally is, is settled, rested. That's why it's called the second death. So physical death, spiritual death. What, he that hath life doesn't have the spiritual death. Jesus made that clear. They shall never die. So it's simple. Hath life and hath not life. It's hard for us to see that when we're talking to people that are lost and realizing the wrath of God is abiding on them. May God give us a desire to help point them to Christ. All right, Revelation 20. This goes back to all those words I was just using with the word life and death. Watch all this come out in, in Revelation. So, so the Bible opens up in Revelation 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it in whose heaven and earth fled away, and there was found no place for them. In other words, this situation is where the lost are going to stand before God, you'll see here, and the only thing holding them up is God. And that's when they'll realize it's over. There is no second chance. That's why he says, and there was found no place for them. As God's holding them up, Nothing else but God. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before it. The living aren't there. Those that have life aren't there. It says the dead are the ones that are at this, this judgment. And then he says, and the dead were judged. Not Jesus said, if you, had, if you believed on me, you passed from death to life. Believers have life. They're alive. 
They don't die. They shall never die. But the people that are here at the great white throne are dead. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life, which means they're dead. And then watch what he says. And the sea gave up the dead. Again, the word dead over and over. Death, death, and hell were delivered. I'll try to go into that briefly. And then we say, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. See the difference? Everything Jesus talked about, for, for people who believed on him, it was life. But the people that show up at the great white throne, there's no term used life. It's, they aren't living. They're dead. There's death. So I wish I had a chart I could draw on here. So you're going to have to help use your visual mind right now. When Jesus rose from the grave, before he rose to the grave, people went to two compartments that God put together. One was called hell, and one was called paradise. Remember the thief on the cross? Remember me when thou enterest into thy kingdom? And he said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. There was, which is known in Luke chapter 16 as Abraham's bosom. Abraham, folks, weren't, their salvation wasn't complete until Christ finished the work on the cross. So when Jesus was in the garden, sweating as it were blood and, and sweat, he wasn't thinking just about you and I and what he had to do. He was thinking about all those he made a promise to that he was going to redeem and deliver. Why? Because they were awaiting their redemption. And so when Jesus died, he went down, I know this is deep, and he preached unto the spirits in the prison, and he released those that were awaiting their redemption. Those in paradise, Abraham's bosom, because the Bible says in Ephesians 4, he went down, he, before he ascended, he descended into the lower parts of the earth, and then he took with him men. Now, hell is the other compartment we read about in Luke 16. That Think of it this way. There's a jail sentence that people... Who, who die without Christ, go there and await their prison sentence. All it is is a, it's a holding tank for people who are lost. That place called hell is still filling up, has been from the days of Adam to now. But there's coming a day when that compartment will be released and they will all stand. That's where it says, and death and hell were delivered. That is their day now to stand before the judge at the great white throne to be sentenced for their, not works, but their sins. Which their works are good or bad, whether, but at the end of the day, nothing will get past God. Nothing. And they will have to give an account for that without Christ. And they will never make it. So then we read, death and hell were cast in the lake in the fire. And the Bible concludes that. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life, who has life? Believers. Who doesn't have life? Unbelievers. Whosoever is not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Does everybody get this now? Now, I know we all know this, but can we teach it to others about what's the difference between the great white throne and the judgment seat of Christ? Because the judgment seat, we got a third argument, now it's going to become even clearer. And the third position, we'll get into in a minute. But I want to make sure you saw all the terms there, dead, death, hell, and all that, as it relates to the great white throne, never, never to the judgment seat of Christ. All right, so concluding statement. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, the second death hath no power. You ought to rejoice in that when you go home today and say, God, thank you that I am not going to partake of that. This is, it, it, it's not real to us. I think sometimes we just, we, it's like a shadow. Like we don't think much about it, but the reality is we could have said no to God and had the wrath of God on us and spent eternity in the lake of fire. And yet God chose mercy opened our eyes and allowed us to see this so we could have life. Woo, man. Makes me want to shout. 
I think every day I just think about, you know, walking in the cool of the garden with God. Wow, what a privilege I have. And I could have been the guy that said no. But God had mercy on me and you. So before I get into the third argument, Paul begins to lay out the judgment seat of Christ. And he begins with this illustration. He moved from gardening, as we read last week, to building. He was really masterful in illustrations. And here <clears throat> he talks about this foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ, clearly in the context of verse 10, verse 11, Jesus is the foundation by which we all build upon from this point on. Once we receive Christ, now God says, I got work for you to do, and you're going to build on that. You're going to glorify me. You're going to honor me, and you're going to get a reward for it. Wait a minute. What are you talking about? I'm just glad to be saved. I'll take that. Problem is, too many people take just that and don't do anything for God. And God says, oh, no, this is just the beginning. I gave you the foundation, which is Jesus Christ. Let's talk a little bit about that. Because this is an important subject. In Matthew 7, which, by the way, is the conclusion, verses 24, actually, to the end of the chapter, is the conclusion of the lengthiest sermon found in all of Scripture. We know it is the beginning with the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. It was a lengthy sermon. And when Jesus got through, he says, you guys understand all these things? Yea, Lord, we do. No, they didn't. <laughs> they didn't have a clue. They had to learn these things. But foundation, he say, he, he's comparing two people, wise and the foolish. We know the foolish says there is no God. But the wise, he builds this foundation upon the rock. This is important. The other foundation is upon the sand. So, again, when you have life or you have not life, you either you built it on rock or you built it on sand, life. The ones who built on sand, they're lost. The ones on, on the rock, they have the proper foundation. I thought this was interesting because this, there's, a, there's a common thread throughout Scripture when you, when you get into terminology like the rock. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, um, talking about the rock that Moses he, he hit and the water flowed out, he says very clearly, and that rock was Christ. So I can go back and I can study scripture to see if, well, are there instances of the rock as it relates to Christ? So the foundation equals the rock, which equals Christ. So bear with me here for a second. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. So when Paul said that rock was Christ, He's talking about the Old Testament that he was writing about Jesus Christ. When Moses went, bam, and hit that rock and water flowed out, do you know what that was a picture of? That was a picture of the Father smiting the Son in the crucifixion for you and I and outflowed water of life to all of us who will drink of it. That's why Paul was using that illustration. So I can go back and I can look at Deuteronomy. Notice this is amazing. And this is all, by the way, I, I didn't, this underline and this capital, this is found in Scripture. This is exactly what it says. Then he forsook God, which made him, talking about Israel, and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. Notice the capital R. You know what that, why it's capitalized? Because it's talking about a person. Now the New Testament said that rock was Christ. And by the way, that rock was Christ, but there it called him God, Jehovah God, another deity verse of Jesus Christ. Of the rock, capital R, it says, that begat thee, thou art unmindful. I didn't know rocks gave birth, man. But this rock gave birth. That begat thee, are thou, you've forgotten about him, is what he's saying. This rock gave you birth, and you've forgotten about him. For their rock, small r, is not as our rock, capital R. See how important words and meanings and purpose? I mean, God preserved the small r and the capital R because one's about talking about the person of 
Jesus Christ. Their rock is not as our rock. You could go through the scriptures here and it, it becomes mind-numbing how much God uses the rock as an illustration of Jesus Christ. Daniel chapter 2. The last ten toes of the last ten kingdoms on this earth are destroyed by a stone, which is Jesus Christ, that smashes the ten toes and fills the whole earth with his mountain, which is the reigning of Christ on the earth. Jesus said to Peter, what did Peter say? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. What did, Pe what, what did Jesus say? My Father revealed that. That wasn't revealed by man. That was revealed by the Father. Then what did he say? He said, upon this, oh, thou art Peter, which by the way means Cephas, which means small rock, pebble. Thou art Peter, small, pe small rock, and upon this rock, the rock of his confession that Jesus is Christ, the Son of the living God, that's where I'll build my church. Again, over and over you see this similarity of God using the language. Jesus Christ is our rock. People say, oh, I'm so fearful, and I, I'm so anxious about everything. Like, well, why don't you just try standing on the rock of Jesus Christ? That's the stability we have in this life. The rock. The rock. I could go on and on, but I'll leave it at that. Once the foundation is laid, oh, the building begins. Some of you have been saved for a long time, haven't you? You've been building. Now, there's a lot of things you're not going to remember. I just want you to know that. I mean, I look back in 40 years of being saved. I, I, I don't remember all the good things. I, I don't want to, personally. I don't want to brag. I don't want to, I don't want to dwell on that. I want to know what, what, uh, what do I have to do today for God, not what did I do. I'm going to let God sort that out, and he will. He'll remember the good. He'll remember the not so good. But God is wanting to reward me for the good that I do. Isn't that something? And, but we got to be careful how we build because we're given two sets of materials in this life. We're given gold, silver, and precious stones, which are eternal, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 3, verse 12. And then we could build with wood, hay, and stubble, which is the temporal things of life. That ha which, by the way, when it's put to the fire, now be careful, everybody runs for cover when they hear that word. You're going to be facing Jesus Christ with fire. What I want everybody, what I'm trying to do is settle this in my mind. This is, it's really hard sometimes to think about things that are eternal, things that are in the future. We tend to live now. But if we ever give this thought, what, what I'm doing now, though it's sacrificial, though it's painful, sometimes it's suffering, sometimes it's lonely, doing it for Jesus, but knowing that one day it will matter. And we, if we think that way, if we, we make that determination we'll end up with more gold, silver, and precious stones than we were with something that will burn up in the fire. Say, fire, man, fire. Oh, yeah. So here's the position, argument number three, and I'll have to close on this. Woo! Every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day, that's the judgment seat of Christ, shall declare it, not the man, the work. Because it, the work, shall be revealed by fire. The fire try every man's work. Now, the fire doesn't try the man. Because the man's already been tried because it fell on Jesus. He has life. This isn't about the man and his sin. This is about what the man did so he can receive a reward or a loss of reward. So every man's work shall be revealed of what sort the quality of the work the motive of the work. And so next week, when I have time, I'm going to open up with six questions that I believe are going to be asked of all of us at the judgment seat of Christ. I believe God's already given you some of the answers to the test. And you'll see that next week. But that sort, that quality, is what the fire is going to reveal. We can put on a display before man, but not before God. He's going to bring that all to light it's clear that the judgment's not for sin. And it shall be revealed by fire, which causes people to be like, oh. okay, first of all, there's fire at this judgment. But did you notice at the great white throne there's no fire? Where's the fire? It's after the judgment. 
This judgment is the fire is used to reveal something, but in the great white throne, the fire is used to burn for eternity. Big difference. So, close on this. Jesus Christ is the judge in Revelation chapter 1, a description of the judge who's going to sit on the throne and he's going to judge each and every one of us as believers. Notice the context of the judge before the church. His eyes were a flame of fire. Now, that doesn't mean he's shooting, like we see in the movies today, flames of fire out his eyes. It's a description of what he sees and what his glory is like. And, his, and he's going to be able to read everything about what we did. Every motive, every thought is going to be there. And the feet were like fine bread as if they, there it is, burned in a furnace. There's fire again. Everything connected to his throne before the church, which is the context of Revelation 1, as a judge, has fire connected to it. His countenance was as the sun, which, by the way, is a ball of fire, shineth. So you have three things that represent fire with Jesus Christ represented as the judge before the church. So when the Bible says that the fire shall reveal it, that's the fire he's talking about. Then he says, if any man's work abide which he built upon the foundation, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he himself shall suffer loss, no reward or loss of reward, but he himself shall be, what does it say? Okay, but he has yet so as by fire. In other words, you still got to go through the fire. You can't get around it. The fire is going gonna, is gonna to determine if your work is gold, silver, or precious stones, or if your work is wood, hay, and stubble. And the, and the only, way, only one who knows that is Jesus Christ. We don't even know sometimes. God will bring that to light on what we did for him, and we get a reward, or we suffer loss. How horrible would it to be knowing you're saved, but then you wind up with nothing? When you had every opportunity to have something, God wants to give you something, but now you can't get it because you didn't live for him or you didn't do what you didn't build the right way. So in conclusion, the work abide, there's a reward. There's a work that's burned. It's a loss of reward. So and I'll I'll have a conclusion statement next week along with those questions. And then we'll we'll wrap up first Corinthians three and get into first Corinthians chapter four which is a, kind of a crescendo statement from Paul about division. So with that, I hope that your boat's been filled. <laughs> I know mine is. I've been studying this for, for years, and it's just, as, it's just as fresh today as it was the first time I learned this stuff. Isn't that something? The only way I can explain that is it, it's the Word of God is... Quick and powerful, it's alive. So with that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you that we've had this time to study together as your people. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to see the things of God, to allow us to see the differences, to help us, Lord, in understanding the importance of these things, but, Lord, also to, to consider what this means for our, our own personal life. Are we doing what you called us to do because we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ as your children. Thank you, Lord, that we have life, and we've passed from death unto life, and we shall never die, because the promises of God are sure. And we can bank on that for eternity. Thank you, Father. But help us to build upon this foundation the gold, silver, and precious stones that you've given us to do. May it bring glory and honor to you as we ask this all in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <laughs>